good yawning this morning and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. It is the Friday, it is Friday the 29th of November 2024 and you are on the clock with Erin Green. Today is also Women Human Rights Defender Day, that's November 29th. Women Human Rights Defenders are women who defend human rights and defenders of all genders who defend the rights of women and rights related to gender and sexuality. Their work and the challenges they face have been recognized by a United Nations resolution in 2013 which calls for specific protection for women human rights defender. This morning, defenders, this morning, I can say, unfortunately, I have been a victim of both like interpersonal and systemic violence as a human rights defender. However, fortunately, that puts me in a unique position where I can speak to the issue from my own personal experience. You know, absolutely. So we're going to talk a bit about that today. I have a special show lined up. Today we are in Antrobus and Alicia Wallace. We are talking about reproductive genocide and work taking place through the Caribbean and globally. This work is being led by a group called the Palestinian Feminist collective. Today we are going to share some of their work in this conversation about reproductive genocide, reproductive justice, and what is a history of settler colonialism throughout the world. Hopefully today we can draw comparisons to the history of settler colonialism both in Palestine, in the Middle East, and in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and the region, the Caribbean region. I would like to introduce guests. Good morning, Dr. Peggy Antrobus and Alicia Wallace. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good. Good morning. It is a pleasure to have you in studio with me this morning, even if only via Zoom. Alicia Wallace is the founder and uh, executive director of Equality Bahamas. Dr. Peggy Antrobus is an anachronism, a West Indian. Since the 1970s, she has worked to try to make the Caribbean a better place by focusing on women's empowerment, social, cultural, economic, and political. First with the Michael Manley government in Jamaica, establishing the region's first women's bureau. Then with UWI, establishing the Women and Development Wand Unit in Barbados. And later with the Network of Women from the Economic South, promoting development alternatives with women for a new era, dawn through wand. She had, she, through one, she was a strong supporter of CAFRA Barbados. CAFRA is the Caribbean Association for Feminist yes. Research and Action. She understands clearly the distinctions between what governments, NGOs, and social mov movements can do at local, national, regional, and international levels. She believes that it takes the combination of work at all these levels to bring about change using professional, cultural, and political approaches. Along the way, she has done a lot of speaking, speaking, written a lot of stuff, published in magazines, journals, and books, and a book, The Global Women's Movement, Origins, Issues, and Strategies. She has been trying to retire since 1995 when she stopped working at UE. She continues to believe that another world is possible. Good morning. Ma'am, uh, may I, Peggy? Yes. I love the bio. I think for every advocate, right, that they have been trying to stop working, but somehow <laughs> they cannot pull themselves out of the struggle for equality, equity, and justice. Uh, good morning, Ms. Wallace. Good morning. Absolutely. So today we are talking about reproductive genocide and Israel's 
uh, settler colonial project and genocide in Palestine, uh, drawing our attention to the presence of what reproductive genocide is in that particular region and a broader conversation. So I want to start the show by asking, well, Peggy, would you like to frame the discussion for us? Yes, thank you very much, Erin. Um, and thanks for giving me this opportunity to be in solidarity with Palestinian women today. Um, let me just say something about the Palestinian feminist collective. Yes, ma'am. Um, because you have a tape that we're going to play shortly. So the Palestinian feminist collective is a network of young um, Palestinian women, mostly teaching in universities in the United States. Um, their statement on reproductive genocide is their response to the Zionist propaganda about the Hamas rapes on October the 6th last year. And those so-called used as a justification for the bombardment of Gaza, of what of Israel's response to that attack by Hamas on the 6th of October. Um, I want to show why we should be in solidarity with Palestinians by highlighting the ways in which their situation today connects with our own history of settler colonialism and the contemporary crises created by that, those inextricable links between patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. So um, I think you should play the tape. I wanted absolutely particularly to have the voices of, Palest of Palestinian women today, not just my voice. And I asked one of them, who was a, an author of the statement on reproductive genocide, to say something about it. So, Erin, if you could play the tape, the clip, the first clip. Yes, we'll play the first clip. And then after the first clip, we, I will read briefly from the statement, the Palestinian Feminist Collective Condemns Reproductive Genocide in Gaza. Producer? Reproductive genocide includes many forms as we are witnessing in real time in the Gaza Strip and includes mass incarceration. It doesn't, um, it's not limited to the Gaza Strip. We're seeing this in the West Bank primarily. It includes psychological warfare and collective punishment, the practice of ethnic cleansing, gendered and sexual violence of women and girls by an occupying state or force, in this case, the state of Israel, gendered and sexual violence of men and boys, also by an occupying state or force, and forced conditions of unlivability. It means the desecration of the human body, both of the living and in the dead. Israel has a unique practice of not only incarcerating children, but keeping them indefinitely, even after they die, um, and sometimes in mass morgues in prisons until they carry out their sentence. So post-mortem post -mortem detention is something that is happening in Palestine, also within reproductive genocide. What we have to understand about reproductive genocide is that it's part of a larger struggle for Palestinian indigenous people over our land and our sovereignty. It is uh, based on this notion that settler colonialism is a structure that's inherently anti-life, um, anti-environmental life, ecological life, but also human life. Um, and it's a tool for erasure. So it's something used deliberately in order to target women um, and the future. So we see this happening. This did not begin on October 7th, of course. This began um, around the Nekba. The Nekba is an Arabic word that means catastrophe. And it's a both an event that occurred over the course of two years, 1947 to 1949, with the official declaration of Israeli statehood on Palestinian indigenous lands. But it's also an ongoing process of which reproductive genocide is a, is a huge feature. During this time, 500 plus Palestinian villages were exterminated. Israel statehood was established on the ruins of these villages. And again, this is a, an event and a process of dispossession. Um, dehumanization since October happened in many, many ways. Some of them would be 
um, allegations that Palestinians rape, but Israelis don't, right? We see this over and over and over again, despite this, and despite the false misinformation campaigns that all have all been debunked by the most mainstream of newspapers, there is still this sort of conditional, or I shouldn't say conditional, but a comparative humanity where Palestinians are always having to prove their innocence. Um, and this, um, according to um, Craig Mokieber, this propaganda is necessary to dehumanize Palestinians, to create a sense of revulsion in the Western public so that Israel can continue to commit genocide with the West's support. Moreover, media representations have only enabled this. They've either ignored what's happening in Palestine, which allows people to turn a blind eye um, where most of us can't sleep at night, right? Um, uh, especially when we're seeing this torture and mass murder of, of women and children, um, but also the weaponization of falsified rape allegations to justify genocide that is itself contingent on a dehumanization, particularly of Arab men and Arab masculinity. Um, there was also the celebration of sexual violence against Palestinian prisoners in this DT man um, by Israeli forces with protests actually happening to promote and support the perpetrators of this heinous crime. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so I wanted to say that the history of settler colonialism mm -hmm. and reproductive genocide can be traced all the way back to what happened in the Americas 500 years ago when the, with the arrival of the Europeans. Because what drives reproductive genocide is economic greed. It's economic greed. Mm -hmm. But it's led by patriarchy and facilitated by white supremacy. In other words, white men. Absolutely. I use the word patriarchy and mm -hmm. white supremacy because I don't want to talk about individual. I want to talk about a structure yes. of male superiority and domination. I want to talk about a structure of white supremacy. Right. And I'm not talking about individuals because clearly, you know, there are wonderful white men, individuals and wonderful, um, you know, white people. Absolutely. We're not racist. So I use those words that are not familiar, but I, I use them because I want to talk about these structures. Right. We're talking about structural violence and systemic violence. violence versus interpersonal violence. Right. Right. But I want to pick up on the point that she made, the, the dehumanization of the indigenous people allow the Europeans to pretend that the land was without, if indigenous people are not people, there's no people on this land, right? Right. And, and therefore, there's for the taking we, and, to, and for them to engage in reproductive genocide to make basically to remove them, to remove these people, to make their history, their culture, their very existence invisible. Mm -hmm. there, there's an example I, I want to use to draw us to a question of whether we, today we are still not just experiencing <clears throat> that settler colonial dynamic, but that we may be perpetuating it or reproducing it. Recently, a United States university, uh, per federal law, returned a number of relics, uh, remains of indigenous peoples that were taken, people that were taken from this island. Those remains have been returned to the island. And at this point, the state appears to be preparing to put those items. Members of society are saying, hey, pause for a second. Let us acknowledge that there are indigenous peoples still living in community throughout the region. Why don't we reach out to them and ask them for the best indigenous practice, right? To be applied contemporarily for the housing of these remains, mm. whether they should be buried in an indigenous practice, right? Or if they should be returned to an indigenous community that is not located in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, but would have been genetically related maybe or culturally related to those peoples, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that we're having 
a similar discussion or not having the discussion in the ways in which we invisibilize the indigenous people for the purpose of an economic gain or credit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you see it also in the, you know, the assumptions that, that somehow um, Europe has a right to determine um, our development patterns, mm -hmm. what we do. Yes. Uh, and I, I wonder you know, if they, that that's neocolonialism. We are still in the grips of neocolonialism, even though we are officially of independent, right? Right. What has what has independence meant? It is it is meant interdependency, but on systems that in, in a system with an obvious power imbalance. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, I wanted to draw Bahamians to the question. Are we in the Bahamas, in the Caribbean, vulnerable to the same socioeconomic, socio-political, and environmental dynamics taking place in Palestine and the Gaza Strip right now? Do Bahamians consider that the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and the Caribbean, by extension, geographically, in some people's minds, that construct, that idea of the space is more valuable than the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, the country, which is a composition of people bound by, by language and history, right? That, that we are possibly vulnerable to the same dynamics that are at the root of the violence being experienced in Palestine and the Gaza right now. Erin, mm -hmm. I love the way you're posing those questions because I think in this uh, very short amount of time we have, we're not offering answers, we're raising some questions. Yes. We want other people to think about it. Right. I, 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 oh, sorry, go, go on. Yeah, the dehumanization of the people of Africa, because mm -hmm. there's a very interesting dis difference between what they did to the indigenous people and what they did to the African people. Um, they needed the labor of Africans, right? So they didn't want to genocide them. They didn't want to kill them. On the contrary, they wanted to keep them alive so that they can use them. But it was still a process of dehumanization of people of African descent that allowed the Europeans to enslave us and to turn us into commodities yes. and subject those enslaved people to the most brutal and degrad degrading treatments imaginable. Um, Peggy, our Pan-African brothers and sisters, they call that experience the Ma'afa. And mm. it is a, 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 a process or a practice of what I think we could call psychological genocide, right? Yeah. Where you remove a connection to, to original and indigenous language. You remove the connection to land, right? To, to culture, to, mm. to convince the individual that they are your creation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that they are to think what... You tell them to think because you made them. Yeah. But you know that, that um, what they did, uh, you said psychological, it's also that cultural thing. Of, that's the basis of race, racism. That mm -hmm. whole idea of racial inferiority has become the foundation of the racism that we're experiencing mm -hmm. all over the world today. Absolutely. And one of the problems one of the elements that we often ignore is that these systems are also very violent, right? right? Toward mm -hmm. those that, res that are responsible for upholding it. Uh, yeah. White supremacy, people who practice white supremacy, whether wittingly or unwittingly, intentionally or unintentionally, right? There's a term called ontological whiteness where people are so consumed by white language, culture, that they forget that they're not white. And Peggy, <laughs> let me, let, let me make, well, a, let me make, like a, let me make yeah. another distinction for the purpose of this conversation. Mm. Mm. We are talking about race as a construct. That is mm -hmm. separate from ancestry. Mm -hmm. Race is a construct formed by a small group of Europeans who intended to privilege, to create a privileged class. Right, They created whiteness and placed themselves in it, and everything else was blackness. Over time, gradations of blackness have appeared, and we sort of import or confuse 
ancestry with race, but race is mutable. It changes over time, language, culture, geography, and, and your DNA. So when we say that white people are also victims to white supremacy, understand that many people cling to the term white people because they are unable to trace their roots back to their indigenous European lands. Many people are unable to say they are Polish American in the same way I don't know, right? Oh, and, and then let's take that an, an, another layer. Polish is nationality. Mm. With, within Poland, there are ethnic groups. Mm. People who are Polish may, know, may not be able to trace back to their ethnic origin, their, right? their tribal origin either. And that is a violence, the same violence that we, as people of African descent, say, hey, I don't want to be referred to as black, refer to me as African, just because I can't trace my roots back to the original tribe means nothing, right? And so I make that distinction so that people who identify as white understand what it is we're saying when we are interrogating whiteness. We are not interrogating people. We are interrogating constructs and structures and systemic violence. Yes. Now, and in on. that process, they lose their own humanity. Yes, ma'am. We're going to go to a break. And when we come back from the break, uh, we're going to transition. Would you like to transition to the second clip? Yes, after the break. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And to the audience, I hope you're enjoying. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. Long time. Girl, what going on? I hear women in Bahamas can't pass on citizenship to them own children. We had one jokey government halfway try to change it with a referendum in 2016. And two administrations since then ain't even bother. I shock you going back to live like that. What are you supposed to do with your own children if they ain't Bahamian? Suffer. Luckily, Equality Bahamas been working on this issue. And I hear they ramping up for a full campaign. Good. Y'all need action. The Bahamas like to play top class, but have all these old, old issues that the rest of the region done deal with long time. You right, we gotta get it together. Let me go online right now and tell my people share tiny.cc slash nationality. We need the same right path on citizenship to our children. Yeah, get on our level. Love the show? Want to give your support? Become a sponsor today. Call 302-2300 for our rates and packages. That's 302-2300. Become a sponsor on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Good morning and welcome back to On the Clock with Erin Green. We are in conversation with Dr. Peggy Antrobus and Alicia Wallace. We are talking about reproductive genocide, reproductive justice, and the connections with our own history of settler colonialism and the contemporary crises created by the inextricable links between patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. Again, I want to reiterate, in this conversation and in other conversations, when we talk about whiteness, we are talking not about individual people, but about a construct, a, a, a system, and a system within which white supremacy, right, meets out and operates in violent ways. But before we transition to the clip, I just want to read this text. The text says, Ms. Green, when we identify as Bahamian over being African, we do as you just said as to them creating us and our identity. And so I think the text is saying, like, I appreciate your point in making the distinction, the ethnicity, but when you see Bahamian saying, I'm not African, I'm Bahamian, 
they are in their own way attempting to establish like a, an independent or a sovereign identity. Uh, it's very interesting. And I think uh, I have to pick that conversation up at another time. So we're going to move into clip B, focusing on pregnant women, torture, the targeting of journalists and colonial feminism. So there are an estimated 5,500 pregnant women in Gaza that are giving birth every month. They are experiencing starvation, dispossession, displacement, aerial bombardment, severe stress on their bodies, trauma. They are subjected to cesareans without anesthetics. The doctors have been forced to perform ordinarily unnecessary hysterectomies on young women in an attempt to save their lives, leaving a large number of women. Pressure births have increased by 30% since October 7th. And the stress and trauma has disproportionately impacted pregnant women. On November uh, 3rd, 2023, the World Health Organization warned that maternal deaths are expected to rise. Um, there's been a rise in stress-induced miscarriages, stillbirths, and premature births, the report indicated. In January 2024, Healthcare workers reported that there was a 300% increase in miscarriages in Gaza. This is not new, of course. We've seen this with the Nazi regime's use of forced sterilization. Um, we've also seen this weaponization of rape during uh, the Rwandan genocide. Um, and all of these points are, are related, right? They're all tools for, for, for the sake of um, breaking the spirit um, um, through the woman's body. Uh, I wanted to share a part of the Palestinian Feminist Collective statement here. We bear witness to the reproductive genocide taking place in Palestine by the Israeli regime. We bear witness to traumatized mothers who have used without anesthesia, with doctors using flashlights on their phones to conduct the operations due to being cut off from electricity by the occupation forces. As Palestinian women and girls of reproductive age are dealing with aerial strikes on their neighborhoods, schools, and shelters, they are forced to take pills to stop their menstrual flow in the sheer absence of basic feminine care. Okay, so the uh, third point about reproductive genocide is that it includes sexualized torture. I'm sure you've all by now heard about the events in Sidi Man, for example. Um, we have learned recently that Israel's uh, use of torture has only increased um, as of August 2024. And this is especially true for Palestinians that are incarcerated in Israeli prisons, um, which has grown exponentially since October. There are almost 10,000 Palestinians that are in Israeli detention centers, torture chambers, centers, um, makeshift interrogation centers, and Israeli prisons, um, and including children. Israel is unique in that it does. Um, it does uh, criminalize and detain children indefinitely. Um, and then there's also ad hoc torture and interrogation camps that have emerged since October 7, substantiated reports of widespread abuse, torture, sexual assault and rape, starvation for extended periods, etc. In order for reproductive genocide to happen of elders, children and babies. So what this means is that reproductive genocide is not unrelated to genocide more broadly. We've been in this genocide for almost a year. Um, 40, 000, over 40,000 people are reported to be killed. You know, the Gaza ministry does not count bodies that are not identified, but estimates are closer to 200,000. There's also a complete breakdown in medical facilities so that they're not able to keep track of the dead um, because of the total breakdown in Gaza's uh, medical um, institutions and facilities. Um, Infanticide, the mass murder of babies. Femicide, the mass murder of uh, women. Sopicide, um, which is the concept that refers to the mass murder of um, intergenerational wisdom. But it's also the deadliest massacre for journalists. The deadliest ma ma massacre of medical professionals and humanitarians. The deadliest massacre of children and babies. Um, so obviously related to the destruction of, of life. 
Wow, that was a very intense clip. I uh, can make, I, I think I can make these clips available upon request for those who are interested in following the conversation. I want to follow up those two clips quickly with a couple of headlines uh, from known, well-known media houses. The first, death toll in Gaza from Israel-Hamas war passes 44,000 Palestinian officials say. That was in the AP, Associated Press, 21st of November, 24. Uh, the Gaza Health Ministry, do, again, does not distinguish between civilians and combatants in its count, but it is said that more than half of the fatalities are women and children. Another headline, nearly 70% of Gaza war dead verified by UN are women and children. This is from the BBC, the 8th of November, 2024. The UN's Human Rights Office has condemned a high number of civilians killed in the war in Gaza, saying its analysis shows close to 70% of verified victims were women and children. Another quick headline, South Africa's legal team says, quote, intent is clear, close quote, in Israel's Gaza genocide. That's Al Jazeera, 28th of October, 24. And another story from Al Jazeera. This one, very interesting. Israeli minister calls for, quote, migration, quote, of Palestinians from Gaza. Israel minister Itamar Ben Gvir has called for Gaza to be emptied of Palestinians and said it was possible for Israel to resettle their territory. He spoke at a settlement conference organized by Israel's ruling party while Israel forces conduct a siege of North Gaza. What is interesting there is that this idea to be emptied is something considered illegal under international law. Uh, Peggy, Alicia, let's talk about what violence meted out to pregnant women looks like and represents. Well, first of all, I have to say it's almost unbearable to listen to what Lila is saying. Yes. It's almost unbearable. You know, it, it would be very easy to just look the other way. Some of us have to kind of withdraw from listening to that news, looking at those images. Um, what Mia Motley calls the, the, you know, it's, it's, we're seeing it live. It's being recorded live, yes. the genocide. It's almost unbearable. I just want to acknowledge that. And I, I want to make a special point that we also acknowledge that our brothers and sisters of Haitian descent and Haitian brothers and sisters may also have an, an, a heightened sensitivity, right, to, mm -hmm. to what it is that they would have heard in that clip just now and what they are observing taking place in Gaza. And also Sudan. Yes. You know, it's happening and in places that are not even being covered by the news. Yes. I think it's very important to, to and that's how I see Gaza, that it's telling us in real time and with video, what is actually happening in places that we know nothing about, what, what certain power structures are capable of, what mm -hmm. they're capable of, the level of destruction. But I wanted to use this clip to make a point about what happens when you reduce women to an object, to a body, to a womb. Um, it's, it's like saying, you know, it's, it completely obscures the person. No, it absolutely. It completely obscures the larger issue of women's health. Mm -hmm. And you so know, you're just looking at a womb, you're just looking at a, you know, it's, it's really a way of, of, again, making the woman's body invisible. And you, you are ascribed value, right, based mm -hmm. on the based on your your womb and what you do with it. So if you are right. a woman with a womb right. and you're not making babies, then and in my instance, many people have attempted to remove me from the category, the definition of woman. Because you're childless. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said that. It takes me back to uh, the debate on abortion in the United States. Um, 
the health of all women is now in jeopardy because of this focus on criminalizing abortion. Again, reducing women to their, to their womb and saying, um, you know, the fetus is a, a, per, a human person and you have no control over that. And what has happened now as a result of that abortion ban is that all women, you know, of all ages, just because of the, the physiology of, of being a woman, the biology of being a woman, all women's health is now in jeopardy. Absolutely. I have a text here. They just they want me to identify the source of the clips. The clips represent a state statements from a member of the Palestinian Feminist Collective. <laughs> yes. And that is not to put her in any kind of jeopardy. The um, Palestinian Feminist Collective has come out openly. They're the most courageous people you can imagine because it's me to the... Um, to another one of the you know points I wanted to make about human rights defenders, the risks you take when you try to, to speak out about these things, the enormous risks are to yourself. Um, at the and individual level human, and at human the human professional level, as we as we as we make these things visible, as we try to make the invisible visible, mm -hmm. um, we draw these things to people's attention to change the narrative. We are placing all of ourselves at risk. Some people are losing their jobs. Some people are losing their lives. Getting a journalist, for example. Yes. Uh, the, the, the targeting of journalists in war zones, treating them as if they are combatants, ignoring international rules of war. Uh, and then the, the, the silent silencing of voices and cancel culture in the Western world. Mm -hmm. attempts to invisibilize anyone who appears to be in allegiance with, willing to support, or like you say, even create a space for others that do support to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, they find mm -hmm. themselves in jeopardy. Um, right. You know, Erin, um, I also wanted to just sort of highlight the way in which torture of Palestinians of all ages, just an extreme form of violence. I mean, these days, uh, 16 days of activism against violence against women. Um, and people tend to think of violence in a very narrow way, you know? Yes. Of, um, you know, uh, sexual violence or... Physical violence. Physical violence. But violence is much, much larger than that. Mm -hmm. um, there's economic violence, there is political violence, there's social violence. And, um, the, and then there's financial violence, right? And so yeah, in yeah. 2010, the uh, Domestic Violence Act expanded the definition of violence to include financial violence, emotional, I think, it, violence. Uh, and then it also expanded the categories of people. Who, I think there's a distinction between economic and financial violence, right? Where economic violence is structural and systemic. And financial violence is when a one partner or a member of the household or relationship withholds finances or manages finances in a, a way that disadvantages or abuses the other person. Mm -hmm. So violence is both structural, but it's also individual. It's at, at both of these levels, in both of these ways, we experience violence. Yes. Can you um, give a definition of sexual torture that's been referenced in uh, the clip, I think, and in the statement? I, d I don't want to give a... Okay, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, but let's, not, let's just say that... I can't really do that because I can't reduce it to a definition. I think, listen to that clip again, and it outlines so many examples of that, of the way in which um, sexuality is used um, to hurt people and to violate them. Absolutely. Um, I know that the time is running out, but you know, um, Erin, you, when we talked yesterday, we mm. talked about the term colonial feminism, and it wasn't in the clip, but the Palestinian Feminist Collective are calling out what they call colonial feminism and, and really challenging us as feminists, those of us 
who call ourselves feminists or who call ourselves um, defenders of women's rights and asking us to examine our own understanding, our own approach to the issue of women's rights. You know, are we feminists that defend the status quo? Because that's what they mean by colonial feminism, that defends the status quo. Yes. And the status quo is a status quo of violence, perpetrating and patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. Yes. Um, so I, I would, well, when, you know, Peggy, when, the question, we, the challenge to all okay. of us as women or people in, engaged in, in recognizing these um, days, uh, 16 days of activism or who continue to work as advocates and activists in the cause of women's rights, we really need to examine ourselves and what what kind what is our approach? You know, even though I don't say that everybody can do everything, I mean I think it is only it is understandable why you would have a group of, of feminists working just on violence against women or just on issues of housing or just on issues of reproductive health. I'm not saying that you can't do that, but you have to recognize that all of these things happen within a larger framework. And we have got to pay attention to that larger framework. Uh, and that framework includes uh, racism and class um, and culture. Yeah. Um, and so and environmental not, concerns. They're uh, using the word intersectional feminism now. Yes. And so, yeah. uh, Peggy, we have to go to a break. When we come back from the break, let's, let's dive into that a bit more. Let's talk about colonial feminism, intersectional feminism, what people are calling white feminism, Western feminism, and perhaps the term womanism that a lot of women prefer to yes. feminism. Uh, yeah. let's, let's talk a bit about that after the break. Let's get into one or two definitions, like the definition of reproductive justice uh, and uh, a few texts. You guys, stay tuned. You're a builder. You want to give your client the best material at the best prices and you need to put food on the table. Well, check out these prices at Pinder Enterprises. Fire Ace Pressure Treated Roofing Ply starting at $36.68 includes VAT. By the way, all these prices include VAT. Great Select Water Shield, one thirty four twenty a roll. Felt, 15 pounds, 16.50, 30 pounds, 19.80. Owens Corning Duration Shingles and Certain Teed Landmark Shingles, 56.56 a bundle. Gallon of Roof Cement, 33.47. When it comes to screwing and nailing, Pender got you covered. He got every nail and screw you could possibly need. Hey, man, long time. Girl, what going on? I hear women in Bahamas can't pass on citizenship to them own children. We had one jokey government halfway try to change it with a referendum in 2016, and two administrations since then ain't even bother. I shock you going back to live like that. What are you supposed to do with your own children if they're in Bahamian? Suffer. Luckily, Equality Bahamas been working on this issue, and I hear they ramping up for a full campaign. Good. Y'all need action. The Bahamas like to play to the rest of the region done deal with a long time. You right, we gotta get it together. Let me go online right now and tell my people share tiny.cc slash nationality. We need the same rights as men to pass on citizenship to our children. Yeah, get on our level. One in every four Bahamians face some level of food insecurity. AML Foods remains committed to helping. And this year, through our Feed 5000 program, we'll donate $30,000 to provide holiday meals to families in need. But we need your help. From November 4th to December 18th, show your support and donate at the register at Solomon's, Costright, Fresh Market, Exuma Markets, or Domino's Pizza in Nassau, Grand Bahama, or Exuma. Together, let's put an end to hunger. This is Guardian Radio. Your station for up-to-the-minute news and intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversations. 96.9 FM. Good morning. Welcome back. You are tuned in to On the Clock with Aaron Green. 
We are in conversation with Dr. Peggy Antrobus and Alicia Wallace. We are talking about reproductive genocide and the connections between what is happening in Gaza right now and our own history, colonialism, including the contemporary crisis created by the inextricable links between patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. Uh, Peggy, I, when I saw the term colonial feminism, I, like there was a spark and I thought, okay, this new language em embodies, I think better embodies what it is people are, are trying to identify, but perhaps it's not the perfect fit for, perhaps it's not the perfect fit for every woman, a lot of women in the region are concerned about and committed to solutions for issues facing women. They just have difficulty identifying with the assumed or presumed politics attached to the word feminist. Yeah, I think the word feminist is a very problematic word. Um, it has a historical, it has a history, and it is it's, it's the origin in English. I remember when I first started working in Jamaica, setting up the Women's Bureau there. Um, I was at great pains to say I'm not a feminist because it was associated with a lot of negative. Mm -hmm. And I think the use of the word colonial feminism is also has a lot of negative associations that nobody wants to identify with. Mm -hmm. um, I had to... I had to realize that the reason why it has those connotations is partly because of the wish to misrepresent what feminism means or what or what what people who call themselves feminists might be about, because we are challenging patriarchal privilege. Um, myself, um, I began to embrace that word when a white um, North American woman talked about becoming a feminist in its movement. And there within the movement, the challenging um, uh, racism um, and white supremacy, she found herself as a woman marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that is what, for me, really, I find feminist analysis helpful because it really focuses on issues of the power structures, the structure of gender relations, and and how that structure affects us. Um, definitions of masculinity and femininity and has us all, um, you know, in this situation where we can't express ourselves as fully human. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up quickly. Don't worry, Texas. I'm going to read your text. I just want to reiterate uh, the, 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 the term reproductive genocide. We said, what is genocide? Extermination of an entire people. It's ecological, economic, cultural, environmental, and infrastructural reproduction. And that, thus, reproductive genocide is a redundancy. All genocide is intrinsically aimed at reproduction in all its manifold forms. But what is reproductive justice? Well, reproductive justice is the intersectional definition that many feminists across the globe have come to accept and advocate for, but it seeks essentially to do just that, provide, it upholds the right to bodily autonomy for individuals, families, and communities in all decision-making and practices related to sex and reproduction, including the right to have or not have children, the right to give birth free from oppression, exploitation, and violence, and the right to create and raise families in safe and healthy environments. Okay, I'm going to get to the text quickly. My producer is right on time. I feel reproductive genocide is also carried out biologically and especially in poor nations where they even award aid only if nations agree to programs designed to decrease reproduction, like abstinence-only sex education programs. We need to stand with our African people like we are with Palestine. Africans have been suffering for too long. I want you to know that I have statements here, not just from the Palestinian Feminist Collective, but also the Caribbean Feminist Collective that also draws the, the same similarity 
to struggles in on the African continent. Another text just quickly. This is my personal observation as your listener. There needs to be more independent data on the topic. Don't mind me reading from uh, Associated Press and, and BBC, you know, don't mind that. You quoted from Palestinian and Al Jazeera news sources, uh, Palestinian news source. The data might be true, but it seems one-sided, but good show. Today's conversation is focused on statements from the Palestinian Feminist Collective. It is not one-sided. It is a balanced conversation brought from the perspective of one side of, would you say, one side of the conversation. I invite anyone who feels like this conversation was unbalanced to reach out to me and let us set up a framework for another conversation that does what you feel brings balance to the conversation. In the meantime, you can reach out to me if you want reference to these clips and producer... I gain right now, let me just read this question here. For Bahamians, how can we stand with victims of violence and reproductive genocide in Gaza, both individually and structurally? And do we see the potential, the similarities, the Bahamas' vulnerability to the same socioeconomic and sociopolitical and environmental and geographic dynamics Palestine right now? Have you ever considered that the world may consider the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, the geographical location, as more valuable than the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, the country, a collection of people bound by culture and history? Thank you, producer. Thank you, Dr. Peggy Antrobus. Thank you, Alicia Wallace. And most of all, thank you, audience, for your questions. Have a great day. Guardian Radio AM is up next. <laughs>